Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Ixico PLC for your results investor presentation. Throughout this recorded presentation, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Uh, just please simply type in your questions at any time and press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during the meeting itself. However, the company review all questions submitted today and where appropriate, we publish those responses on the Investor Meet company platform. Before we begin, we'd like to submit the following poll and I'm sure the company will be most grateful for your participation. Uh, before handing over to Giulio Cerrone, the CEO, I'd just like to say that we'll be taking the cameras down to make the slides bigger for you during today's presentation and then return them for the Q&A. So if I may, Giulio, hand over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you everybody for attending today's call on our full 2022 results. Um, as I said, I'm, I'm just going to go off camera and uh, talk through um, the, the slides as, as we go through. So uh, if we jump to, to slide three, uh, heading up as a, uh, as a company driven by our purpose, we have a very clear purpose. And in this update, I'll begin by highlighting how we're making excellent progress. Sorry, this is slide too many. Uh, slide three, you jump one slide there, forgot about one, that's right. Uh, just that we're making excellent progress towards our strategic obje objectives in building a best in class and resilient technology platform in neuroscience. Um, Grant will then follow on and provide details of our financial results. Um, and then I'll finish off by describing our new uh, precision in neuroscience strategy, which is aimed at ensuring we establish a strong foundation for medium to long-term growth for the next five-year period. Um, in particular, during the presentation, we'll be highlighting the resurgence in Alzheimer's disease, which uh, many of you are sure will have seen lots of media coverage, uh, and, um, and why we have good reason to believe that there's uh, a growing use of brain health imaging biomarkers by pharmaceutical companies which will result in increased demand and in, um, for Ixico's advanced AI-driven computational analysis of uh, imaging biomarkers. Um, in, in being driven by our purpose, just to explain what that means, um, it's basically very clear that we want to broaden our range of neurodegenerative diseases, um, and that that's going to be very um, uh, evident in terms of the rapidly aging population, which are having a devastating social impact and costing global healthcare system trillions of dollars. Um, so our focus is very much on addressing an attractive pharma services market, which continues to grow as pharma and biotech companies look to outsource and collaborate with companies like Ixico. Um, so whilst th this is um, a, an era of, of significant investment, it's also important to recognize that there will be bumps along the clinical development road, but that the long-term size of the prize for the pharmaceutical industry and companies such as Ixico that support their efforts in clinical trials is significant. And, and in particular, in the case of neurodegenerative diseases, where the requirement and beneficial impacts to society of a new drug approval is particularly uh, urgent and, and large. So in this slide, uh, what we're, we're articulating here is that we continuously focused on developing our neuroimaging biomarker uh, platform for a broad range of, of neurological diseases. And it also highlights uh, what's different about Ixico and, and put very simply, three key points. Uh, we're a pure play in neuroscience, and that's recognized by the industry um, as, as experts in neuroscience. We have a track record of innovation, which again is recognized by the industry for being able to deliver tailored AI-driven analytical services to each client's trial requirements. And thirdly, more recently, we're, we're recognized now for being able to deliver operational uh, support for clinical trials across all phases of development, including large phase three studies. Um, and this is obviously a reflection of the investments that we've made in, in recent years uh, to support trials uh, of any size uh, in any global location. Um, and, and of course, the key thing here was uh, our demonstration that we were able to deliver the world's largest Huntington's disease trials. Uh, in recent years. We've established a, a very valuable position as a trusted partner to many of the world's leading pharmaceutical companies, and, and that track record is really uh, fundamental to our continuing to build a strong position as an approved vendor of choice for, for these companies uh, to support our delivery of projects um, in the coming years. So we'll go to the next slide. So in addition to our operational capability uh, and our expertise in-house, we, we also, over the last decade, have been building a very extensive scientific network with academic collaborators and 
uh, opinion leaders in the different therapeutic areas. And this is very, very important to our differentiated uh, proposition in that we are uh, very much involved with these organizations to gain access to highly contextualized data, which allows us to develop uh, highly sophisticated, advanced analytical tools, uh, first of all, for use in these consortia, but with the aim of those uh, tools being uh, adopted by the pharmaceutical industry. And clearly, this is very important and it allows Ixico to be seen as very much at the forefront of not just neuroimaging, but also the different therapeutic areas and um, being an integral part of the ecosystem that um, determines um, the, the the gold standards uh, in terms of the different therapeutic areas, how those diseases develop over time, and therefore what might be the appropriate uh, uh, biomarkers to assess uh, the, the progression of the disease, uh, which is obviously very important as uh, companies look to develop their own uh, clinical trial protocols uh, to determine uh, whether new drugs are, have efficacy uh, in being able to slow down the progression of a particular disease. So, so uh, the most recent example of this has been the Huntington's Disease Consortia, which we highlighted a few months ago. Um, and what we're basically setting out to do with our next five-year strategy is to replicate the great successes we've had in Huntington and deploy those into the much larger therapeutic areas of uh, Alzheimer's, MS, and Parkinson's, um, but with a, a particular focus initially on uh, Alzheimer's, especially given the, the very positive news uh, from, from recent readouts of the pharmaceutical companies that were presenting at CTAD last week. Um, so I'll more, more about that in a moment. So next slide. So this slide basically summarizes uh, some of the key achievements over the last uh, uh, five-year period, which has been very successful. And obviously, we're, we're going to be building that over the next five years. But, but in addition to reporting uh, a 16% revenue KGAR since 2021 and four years of consecutive profitability, um, we're very proud to, to stand behind the fact that our business model has demonstrated tremendous resilience, uh, not just through COVID, but also a number of early trial cessations that, um, um, you know, obviously, uh, are part of the landscape, but however, um, at the same time, we've also demonstrated a con a consistent and continuous ability to acquire new customers uh, and deliver uh, projects across a broader range of neurological diseases with high levels of quality. And, and Grant will talk more to this in terms of our current shape of our order book and the composition and the success we've had in acquiring new customers uh, over the last uh, 12 months. Uh, in parallel, the other thing I want to highlight here is that we've utilized the profits generated in recent years to invest in expanding both our analytics franchise, but also our operational capabilities so that we are a credible vendor to more pharmaceutical companies around the world. And so with a, a strong balance sheet, continues to, uh, to be debt free and, and, a, and a cash position of uh, just under six million pounds at 5.8 million at the end of September, we're well positioned to continue to invest and support the long-term growth, uh, long growth ambitions of the business. So with that, I'll hand over to Grant now who will present our FY22 financial results. Thank you, uh, Julio. <clears throat> yeah, so just on slide nine and across the next few slides, what I will do is provide a summary of Exco's financial performance over the last 12 months as compared to recent years, as well as the strength, strength of the company's financial position and an insight into the visibility we have looking forward. As Julio has just outlined, as a company supporting the search for solutions to the large unmet medical need posed by neurological diseases, we have a very clear and very defined purpose. In acting this purpose, we are essentially executing on a clearly defined strategy which is to capture an increased share of the neurological clinical trials market by offering the best end-to-end -end services to our clients, including the most accurate measures of biomarkers that relate to neurological disease. Ultimately, what that translates as is that to achieve our goals, we need to win more projects with more clients across a broad range of neurological indications. And it's with this aim that we're balancing the short-term realities of decline in revenue growth the reasons for which I'm, I will go into in more detail and which we've disclosed on several occasions previously, with a focus on the market opportunity that will support a return to growth for Exico 
and the achievement of increased scale in the business. Consequently, as a company, we are viewing the current period as a transitionary period. As you can see in the revenue graph on the left, having shown rapid growth across the period to the end of 2020, when we reported 9.5 million in revenues, we've been, successfully, we've been successful in holding our revenues relatively stable across 2021 and 2022, despite the fact that during that period, we've lost approximately 14 million of contracted revenues from our order book since the start of 2021, as a result of the early cessation of large phase three HD trials and a large early stage natural history study. Now, again, just to emphasize, when I say we lost those, those revenues, it wasn't because of something we did wrong. That's just the nature of the business that we're in. And that some in CNS in particular, which is a very difficult area to achieve uh, market approval of uh, a drug, most trials fail. And therefore, uh, when servicing this area, this market, it's important for us to have a diversified order book to, to manage that. So we've been achieving on our strategic goals by seeking to penetrate a greater diversity of early phase clinical trials, which deepen our order book in terms of client numbers and projects, thereby reducing specific project and client risk. This is a significant positive across the medium and longer terms, but in the short term, these trials are lower in value individually than the larger trials that have, have, have ceased. Because they're earlier phase, um, they also tend to have a lower proportion of analysis work, which for us is higher margin, and a higher proportion of project management type work, which is priced at typical CRO rates and is therefore lower margin. So the consequence of this is that whilst we have seen a small decline in revenues across the period between 2020 to 2022, and expect this to continue into 2023 as we seek to continue to win and start up new client trials to fill the gap created in our order book by the large client trial cessations. The change in revenue mix is reflected in our gross margin, which while still strong at over 60% for 2022, as you can see in the graph in the middle of this slide, has reduced from the high that we saw in 2020. <clears throat> Again, we anticipate our margin will come under further pressure in 2023 in line with existing market expectations, reflecting both the change in revenue mix and the impact of, of slightly lower revenues. But with this said, we are particularly pleased at the ability of the company that we've in managing to maintain our EBITDA profitability over the last three years, which can be seen by looking at the graph on the right. In reporting one and a half million of EBITDA in 2022, we're reflecting the level of revenues achieved, as well as that maintain, maintaining of strong gross margins. And this performance also reflects the investment in our next generation trial tracker platform, which has resulted in the capitalization of costs onto our balance sheet to reflect the long-term returns we expect from these investments. We've also benefited in the period from a couple of one-time impacts. Uh, we have benefited from uh, foreign exchange movements and also the anticipated lapse in a number of share option awards that have have uh, been accounted for, as well as the careful management of, of costs. So looking forward with the clear unmet need across CNS, increasingly a focus of governments globally, our conviction is to continue to invest to ensure we're as best placed as possible to service this demand and return the company to growth. In doing so, we do anticipate that we'll return to losses uh, in 2023, as we're impacted by lower revenues increased costs and the dropout of the PL of some of the one-time beneficial impacts we've seen in, in 2022, whilst at the same time continuing to deliver on our investment plans. And if we turn to, to slide 10, this shows the change in our year-end, uh, being the 30th of September order book position across the last five years. As you can see, at the end of 2022, our order book consisted of 16 million of signed client contracts, the revenues related to which we expect to recognise over the coming few years. This provides us with reasonable rev revenue visibility, despite the significance, as I said, approximately 14 million of recent large client trial cessations that order book has had to absorb. And this is a, a really important point that I want to make sure we convey clearly, that across the last two years, our order book has had 14 million of revenues removed from it because of these large trials for And yet across that period, our order book, we've managed to maintain 
at 16 million, which lower than we would have liked it to be, and effectively returning us to position we were at the end of 2019, actually contains significant grounds for optimism. As you can see from the graph on the right, during the year we signed 12.6 million in new contracts. That included 11 new projects across six clients, three of which were new to Exco. And if you set aside the fact that 6.8 million of, of uh, the order book was lost through client trial scopes, what that means is that we achieved a book to bill ratio of approximately 1.5, which really underlines the potential for Exico to continue to scale across the medium and longer term. And to emphasize that, if we just turn to slide 11, I want to give it a little bit further visibility into the makeup of our order book. Again, these graphs show the order position as at the end of each financial year across the last five years. The graph on the left shows our order book split by trial phase and highlights that we have increased the diversification of our order book across trial phases, particularly over the last two years. This has changed the focus of our order book from phase three, which made up 80% of our order book in 2020, to a much greater proportion across earlier phase trials, approximately 75% on phase one and phase two in 2022. And really what that reflects is the a significant portion of those late phase three trials that uh, ceased uh, in 2021 and early 2022 have been replaced, albeit by smaller but early phase trials in the interim period. And that has two distinct benefits to Xco's future prospects. In 2020, the phase three portion of our order book was dominated by phase three HD trials, which provided very strong revenues and margins, but placed significant reliance on one client and one compound. Over the last two years, we've won many more trials in early phases that have partially rebuilt our order book, but also significantly reduced the reliance on any one client or any one project. We've achieved this both by winning new clients, but also by being recognized as a lead provider in image analysis services across a greater number of CNS therapeutic indications. And therefore we've won new projects, not only with new clients, not only in therapeutic indications that we were already well recognized in, but also in new therapeutic indications with both existing and new clients. And the second benefit is that by having a broader number of clients, uh, which is what is shown by the graph on the right, which shows the order book split by client, where we have approximately double the number of clients and double the number of individual projects that we're supporting compared to two years ago, and therefore brought down the proportion of our order book relating to a single client from just under 80% in 2020 to just over a quarter, just over 25% in 2022. We're now in a position where we have many more shots on goal. And what I mean by that is that by having a greater number of trials in early phases, whilst not all will be successful and some will fail early, which is the nature, as I said, of the, the business that we, we operate in, there is a greater likelihood of some of these projects moving from phase one to phase two and from phase two to phase three. And by being in and involved in these trials early, it is likely that Ixtaco will then continue to provide services to those projects and those clients as their trials progress through the phases. So a key continued strategic imperative for us is to continue to win new early phase trials, which provide a scale basis for revenues within our order book, and then accompany that those successful subset of trials through to phase two and to phase three, which will augment Ixtaco's revenues and profitability whilst increasingly providing it with a scale to manage the inevitable client trial, trial failures that will happen along the way. So, so the key message that, uh, that we're giving here is that whilst we've experienced challenges with those large phase three trials uh, ceasing early, the, the importance of having built up and rebuilt that order book with a large number of earlier phase trials is that we give ourselves much more chance to get into phase three. For a company of our size, phase three trials can be transformational. So with only one or two large phase threes, whilst being augmented by a strong and continuing pipeline of early phases, we actually put ourselves in a position for the longer term to ensure sustainable growth and, and profitability. And just on 
on my on slide 12, just before I hand back to Julio, I wanted to give a bit more visibility on the context within which we're able to make decisions to continue to invest for the for the medium and long term, even though we're we're experiencing challenging times, both in terms of the specifics of having uh, these large trials uh, ceasing early for us, but also in the current macroeconomic environment where we, like other companies, are experiencing rising prices uh, and, and challenging market conditions. By having a strong balance sheet, we fully remain fully in control of our own prospects, but also are able to continue to invest for that future opportunity, whilst others are having to be much more cautious uh, in their approach. So as you can see in the graph on the left on this slide, we completed the year with a cash balance of 5.8 million. That included just under a million of operating cash flows, and that's before we include R&D tax credit inflows on top of that, offset by 2.3 million of technology investments designed to support Mexico's growth strategy over the coming years. As you can see from the middle graph, whilst our investment program peaked in 20, 2021, we have continued to pursue it across 2022, with the primary focus being ensuring that the three pillars of our technology offering are market leading. And just to, to emphasize what I, what I mean by that, when I talk about three pillars, I think the first of those is we need to make sure, and we are making sure that we have a resilient, secure IT infrastructure that complies with the rightly high expectations our large pharmaceutical clients have of any vendor operating in the clinical trial space. So having state-of-the-art infrastructure doesn't win you a trial, but it loses you a trial if you don't have it. And so it's a significant barrier to entry. And we've invested just over a million pounds in that IT base IT infrastructure over the last three years to make sure that we're able to, to deliver on the expectations of our client base. The second pillar is that we have been investing, and we've talked about this before, in our next generation trial tracker platform. That's the platform we use to capture brain images from imaging centers across the globe. This uh, uh, development is now well progressed and we expect to launch it later in 2023. And the third pillar is the biomarker analysis pipelines, i.e. the pipelines that we use to measure biomarkers in the brain uh, from the brain images that we collect from the clinical trials. And it's included our next generation AI platform, execute.ai. That was launched this year and provides increased sensitivity and accuracy for client trials, thereby supporting reduced costs in CNS trial design. And it's worth highlighting, uh, uh, as Julia mentioned earlier, that this has given direct and rapid ROI through a consortium agreement that we signed during the year with uh, CHDI, one the, the world's largest uh, Huntington's disease charity, alongside with two biopharmaceutical companies where we are reanalyzing data that had already been analyzed by others, but using our state-of-the-art uh, analytical capabilities to make to, to provide uh, the, the best MRI data set uh, available in the market. So from balance sheet point of view, the strong combination uh, of our cash balance and the uh, capitalized investments, the capitalized future-looking investments that we, that we have plus the fact that we continue to be debt free, mean that we've further augmented our net asset position to 12 and a half million uh, over the last 12 months, an almost 10% increase on, on the prior year. So just before I hand back to, to Julio and really returning to where I started, which is whilst we have been, and we'll continue to manage uh, a challenging period for the company following the large client trial cessations at, the time, at a time of increasing uh, cost pressures, the market we serve and the capabilities that we have developed give us confidence that we look uh, to the medium and long term in our ability to grasp new opportunities. We're confident that uh, as we continue to diversify and build our order book and deliver on our purpose at a greater scale than has been uh, the case to date. So, Julia, I'll pass back to you. Thank you, Grant. So slide 13, um, so that was, uh, we talked about being driven by our purpose and, and that's by advancing precision neurology. So if we go then on to slide 14, I'll just um, highlight the uh, precision neuroscience strategy that we, we're laying out uh, for, for our journey over the next five years. So the, uh, the first three pillars, as, as I've laid out here, are about building traction 
and further penetrating our core neuroimaging market with a particular focus on maintaining what we believe is a leadership position in rare diseases such as Huntington's disease, but also recognizing that um, we, we plan to significantly ramp up our intensity on larger therapeutic areas just such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's and MS, in which we'd like to achieve significant market share gains over this next five year period of the strategy. The, the last two pillars are all about commercial partnering to create additional stretch growth momentum in our core market or to enable our technology to be deployed in new, large, attractive markets. And this would be through an, a number of different possibilities, um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, as I go through the, the slides here. But the, the key takeaway here is that we're, we are more convinced than ever that there is sufficient runway for growth in neuroscience without having to diversify into new and different therapeutic areas, such as oncology, to build a business of scale and value to all our stakeholders. There's also an intent stated to develop these commercial partnerships, which is additional to the, the past five years where all of our growth has been very much um, grown, grown out of our own uh, organic capabilities. And so acknowledging that uh, to accelerate our trajectory to scale the business uh, and to reach more clients in our designated target markets is that we, um, we plan to uh, devote significant uh, efforts in developing these commercial uh, partnerships. So we've gone to the next slide, and and here I um, just want to talk a little bit about the uh, historical meeting that took place last week at uh, in San Francisco, where the, um, uh, the 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 space of Alzheimer's in particular had really got a, a very big boost of uh, of confidence and really good news. You'll remember that um, just over a year ago I talked about uh, the significance of of Biogen's aducanumab. Uh, drug approval, which was the first drug approved in this space for um, nearly two decades. And, but at the same time as well, it's a very controversial uh, approval. Uh, and it was an approval based on the ability of the drug to reduce the level of amyloid uh, uh, in, in subjects. Um, but it actually didn't, there was some conf conflicting data around whether that came with clinical benefit. Uh, but again, going back to the urgent unmet medical need, the FDA uh, approved the drug uh, and uh, has, has been on the market for, for over a year now. However, with the uh, the news from ASI on their lecanemab drug, uh, they reported out last week that they demonstrated that um, amyloid removal uh, does actually come with clinical benefit, and that's clearly a major achievement. Um, and and with that, uh, some some key key points to to bear in mind is that first of all. Uh, PET imaging and the use of blood-based biomarkers have been used in determining that amyloid reduction. So those have clearly been methodologies that have been um, validated as being able to support potential drug approvals. Um, there's also the um, FDA decision uh, approved to, to fast track this in, in January uh, with a, an anticipated approval in July. So that would mean that we would have two drugs in, in the space of 18 months that have been approved. Whereas previously there, there hadn't been drugs for, for over 18 years. Um, and then the other key thing is that all of these drugs come with a, a warning label that there are potential side effects, uh, notably ARIA. Uh, and so for this reason, that there's likely to be a requirement for post-marketing surveillance trials. And uh, the way that ARIA is monitored is through MRI. So, so the key message in terms of what does that all mean uh, for, for Ixico and companies like Ixico, it, it basically means that um, it looks like we are going to have an approval for um, an Alzheimer's drug in 2023 that used amyloid as a key biomarker. Um, and that throughout that process, um, the reinforcing importance of, of imaging, both MRI and uh, PET imaging uh, during the clinical trial itself, but also talking to the significance of and requirement for uh, MRI monitoring uh, once the drug is out in the market. So, so more MRI and PET before, during and after clinical trials is, is the message. So um, in addition to ASI, there are other companies that also uh, gave important updates. Uh, the most notable one is Eli Lilly, and they talked about their Donanumab 
a drug and uh, they're expecting a readout for that drug in 2023. And again, re-emphasized all similar points in relation to the importance of imaging and the importance of monitoring area. There was also news from Roche where they actually indicated that uh, their drug uh, had actually not succeeded in meeting its milestones. Um, and so Gantanarumab um, uh, was, was uh, called out as, as not progressing further. And this is an example of where uh, th this is a, a trial that we weren't involved in the phase three study of. Uh, but actually now creates an opportunity for Ixico in that um, the key question now for a company like Roche is, okay, if their lead candidate now is not progressing to approval, uh, what do they plan to do? Do they, uh, you know, do they pull out of Alzheimer's or do they double up their efforts? Uh, and obviously I'm not privy to their uh, strategy, but clearly with ASI making progress, Biogen making progress, Lily making progress, um, um, I, I think that... Uh, could actually well be an opportunity for us to again uh, get involved early with potential new assets that companies like Roche will be looking to in the next uh, two to three years. So lots of activity and, and the, the upshot of all of this is uh, will be uh, that the whole Alzheimer's space will have a, um, a, a real resurgence and, and for that reason uh, it's going to be the number one area that we'll, we'll be pointing our efforts to in order to really look to scale the business in the coming years. If we go to the next slide, uh, this again is just the reason I just wanted to put this slide up was just to highlight that it's not just the big guys um, and it's not just late phase studies, but actually there's a very large um, cohort of companies out there, um, basically ranging from big pharma to new innovative biotechs, all with a range of different investigative drugs uh, ranging across a number of different targets, gene therapies, disease modification, and also symptomatic drugs. Um, so a number of these companies, well, I'd say on, on this slide, are actually uh, existing current clients of Ixico's or clients that Ixico's worked with before. And there are, of course, some clients here that Ixico hasn't worked with. And we've taken the opportunity um, whilst we're at CTAD to connect with uh, with all of the above, and um, we're looking forward to developing those opportunities as part of our pipeline of opportunities. Um, I guess the, the, the three key takeaways I, I, I took away from my meetings with the uh, farmer executives that I met last week are the following. Uh, the first one is that Alzheimer's drug development is, ex is experiencing a significant resurgence and confidence of future FDA approvals. Two, the MRI PET molecular imaging and blood-based biomarkers are essential and growing in utility in Alzheimer's disease drug development programs. And three, the, the increased diversification drug targets for Alzheimer's disease therapeutics will drive further demand for neuroimaging, in particular for amyloid and tau monoclonal antibody and anti-neuroinflammation drugs. So with that, um, I just want to move on to what we're doing in terms of making sure that we have the right portfolio and services to be able to meet those requirements. So in slide 17, this really reinforces the message that um, Ixico is, is very well known as a leading provider of MRI services for volumetric measurements of imaging biomarkers used in clinical trials. And, and what you'll see without going into all the different uh, scientific uh, aspects of this slide if you just look at the very top of each box we just got a, a tick and it's basically saying that you know we we have everything that we feel we need to have to address not just the Huntington's disease area but also these other therapeutic areas so so we have the toolkit and uh, we're actively as you can imagine engaging with many companies uh, many of the ones that I showed you on the previous slide uh, to be their vendor of choice for for MRI um, and, and of course, also acknowledging that we're obviously often competing with large billion dollar corporations, usually North American. So it's very important for us to have a differentiated offering, which goes back to my uh, talking to the, uh, the deep scientific network that we have uh, and the capabilities that we have as a pure play neuroscience expert in demonstrating that we really understand this space and we can provide uh, real value add services to our pharmaceutical clients. So MRI, we've got a very good track record, very strong position, um, and we we have all the tools uh, to to go after that uh, that that requirement. Then the next slide is talking about PET molecular imaging, and and just to highlight that uh, PET molecular imaging 
is used for what are called radiology reads and quantitative analysis. Now, radiology reads are basically where uh, you're able to have a network of um, radiologists that are able to read the image and interpret the image, uh, often looking for uh, safety aspects, and, and I mentioned um, some of them earlier, um, but also historically, a lot of uh, visual reads to do to try to attempt to do volumetric analysis and clearly our expertise is is automating volumetric reads and utilizing ai tools to to make that more efficient and also to be able to get more granular detail from uh, pet images and so what this slide is highlighting is that in the last 18 months we've been very busy in building our portfolio of pet and the reason for that is that we've frankly, have been asked by clients to, to do so. And so you'll see that um, in the last um, 24 months, we've uh, built a portfolio, uh, which is pretty comprehensive. We've still got some areas where we want, we are actively uh, investing to, to build a capability. Uh, alpha synuclein, for example, is a very hot area that we, um, we, we see opportunity and we want to develop our, uh, our portfolio for. And, and just to give um, maybe some insight in terms of the progress that we're making here is that um, in 2019, uh, around about 19% of the studies that we were supporting included a pet requirement. And in 2022, this has increased to 29%, so just under a third. So the, the key message here is that we've got really good momentum. Um, and the other point to make is that um, pet, we're seeing increasing use of pet in Alzheimer's and clearly as we've identified Alzheimer's an area we want to focus um, we're basically saying that we want to build on our strong MRI platform and be able to offer both and be one of um, a few companies that we think have credible offerings in both areas um, and secondly that we're we're um, uh, keen to to develop this so that we can also go into Parkinson's disease and PET is often the uh, uh, imaging modality of choice in Parkinson's uh, uh, clinical trials. So by developing the portfolio for Alzheimer's, we're also building a capability to address the, uh, the PET uh, requirements in Parkinson's. So the, uh, the, the other thing to point, uh, to point out is in the, the five pillared strategy I talked earlier, uh, where we talked about commercial partnerships, um, in the area of PET in particular, this is an area where in addition to our own in-house development capabilities, uh, we see an opportunity to develop partnerships with other companies to accelerate our own scientific capabilities and global footprint so that we can address more opportunities with um, more clients around the globe. So, so this is uh, an important uh, development for us, which um, I said we've already got good momentum, but we anticipate uh, being a, a key driver for our growth in the next three to five years. And so, uh, as a final slide, just a, a quick summary of uh, hopefully the messages that you've heard as I've, we've talked through the slides. Um, and first and foremost, that clearly we're addressing an attractive market with long-term macro uh, growth drivers. Um, and we've, we've really built um, a really strong position that is very uh, well, well received by our existing and also prospective clients. Um, I would classify us as, a, as an emerging leader. Um, we've we've uh, got great capabilities in our analytical capabilities, but also combine that with end-to-end -end project management services, which really uh, puts us uh, in a very strong position to be able to be an end-to-end -end service provider, but with a very specialized uh, uh, premium uh, analytical capability for pharmaceutical companies. Uh, and we've also demonstrated the ability to deliver uh, across the whole phases of uh, development from early phase to late phase. Um, and, and Grant talked a little bit to um, the barriers of entry that uh, exist in the marketplace. You know, this is a, a very difficult market to, to get into. The clients are very conservative, rightly so. Uh, it takes time to build their trust. You have to go through a lot of hoops around uh, building Master service agreements and uh, and being approved vendors, um, you know we've we've achieved all of those things. Of course, there's more to do, uh, but we've got a very strong platform to to build on. And then finally, our precision in neuroscience growth strategy 
demonstrates our commitment to continue to innovate, uh, to continue to uh, look to penetrate and scale uh, to, to support that, that growth ambition, um, but also to uh, acknowledge that uh, in the next five year period, uh, that there are opportunities that we should uh, fully investigate to partner and, and where, off, where the opportunities uh, provide themselves to uh, further accelerate our, our, our three early, the first three pillars with m and uh, to accelerate that organic growth. So that's uh, that. With that, I'll, um, I'll I'll close and thank you all for your uh, your listening and uh, hand over back to Mark. That's great, Julio. Thank you very much indeed, and Grant for updating investors this afternoon. Uh, guys, if you want to bring up your cameras, just click on that camera icon at the top of the screen. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please do continue to submit your questions using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Just via the company, take a few moments to review those questions submitted already. I'd just like to remind you that a recording of this presentation, along with the copy of the slides and the published Q&A, can be accessed via your Investor Meet company dashboard. Um, Julio Grant, as you'll see, you've had a number of questions from investors throughout today's call. So thank you, firstly, to everybody for your engagement this afternoon. If I may, um, Julia, if I hand back to you, if I could ask you just to read out the questions where it's appropriate to do so, and then I'll pick up from you at the end. Um, well, that's going to be easy because, um, oh, so, do I have questions? Oh, yes, I do. Sorry, I was on the wrong tab. Um, okay. Um, Matthew asks, how do the different phases of trials differ in revenue terms generally when you say they could be transformational? Um, maybe, Grant, do you want to? That's that one. So can you just repeat that question, Julian? Sure. Um, how do the different phases of trials differ in revenue terms generally when you say they could be transformational? Yeah, so, so um, in terms of the revenues per, per trial phase, it, it, it obviously varies and it, there are a number of factors that are involved. But for a phase uh, one trial, that's usually in the region of half a million to a million pounds worth of revenue. If it's a phase two trial, it's usually somewhere between a million or 750,000 up to as much as 2.5 2 million. And a phase three can be really anything from a couple of million up to, to 10 million or more in terms of value. So in terms of the, if you like, transformational element to that, you obviously can find yourself that you need to, you could be finding something uh, running potentially up to 20 phase ones might be equivalent in revenue terms to, to one very large phase three, but the operational effort to deliver those 20 different phase ones will, will be relatively higher than, than the phase three, which is, which is the sort of the balance that we, we have to strike as an organization that actually you need to be in the phase ones in order to get to the phase threes. It's, it's very rare to just win straight into a phase three, but actually you need a lot of phase ones to get to phase twos to get to phase three. So from a transformational point of view, you only need a couple of phase threes to really transform the business. As we saw, we had a very large phase three back in 2020 that ultimately uh, failed for no reasons of, of, our, of ours, but it, it, it was it was transformational in the business across that period. We were able to build up our business development function to an extent across that period, which means we've won better and more trials since then. So, you know, it's it, it's the key, the, the, the key is having the sufficient balance of enough phase ones, phase two coming three through to manage trials, uh, the fact that there will be trials that fail whilst getting that sustained growth and profitability by those phase through three trials coming through. I, I guess, thanks, thanks, Grant. I mean, the, um, what I'd add to that is, um, you know, uh, a phase three trial might generate three million of revenues in a year. It might take you ten phase ones, or maybe more, to generate a similar revenue number. So, so that's the kind of transformational um, impact um, that that it has on on the on the P and L in the short term. But as as Grant's point said, doesn't that doesn't mean to say that the ten or fifteen early phase are not valuable because they all are shots on goal for potential future phase threes. Okay. Um, um, how much, so uh, Shagar asked the question, how much capital investment will be made in 2023? Um, Grant, sorry, I'll, I'll push that to you as well. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Um, so uh, the amount of uh, capital investment we'd expect to be um, lower than we've invested in 
2022, which again was lower than 2021, but we'd still expect it to be over a million pounds. So, you know, we we are investing for, for the medium and long term. Uh, so that's still very much part of our, our plans. And, and so it will be north of a million pounds. i say less than we've had in the last, last couple of years. Great, okay. Um, so a few questions here. Um, so look, uh, Shagar asked as well, uh, I'll try and spread it around a bit. Uh, do you expect any M&A? So obviously, um, can't comment on specifics uh, until they're, they're specific, but uh, you know, I think being realistic. I mean, we have to be realistic, right? So, uh, over a year and a half ago, our market cap was was fifty million pounds. Today, it's a lot less than that. So, so that makes it a little bit more challenging uh, to to do M and A. Um, but, but I, you know, I would say that um, you know, also other other companies' valuations have also seen a, a similar. A similar impact and just in terms of the the macro uh, macros of, of the public markets but um i guess the, the best and most honest answer i can give to that is that um uh, if they are out there to be done and they accelerate the first three pillars uh then we will we will do them uh, because they're the right thing to do uh, but but that's the key thing for us is really um you know, we have a very robust strong organic plan and that's where our focus is but if we see an opportunity to accelerate those plans uh then then we should do so um but we wouldn't do m a for the sake of m a and doing something totally different and it's very important as i said we're we're a pure play neuroscience business and uh, that's our intention um to stay there because we see lots of runway for growth um so that's the other strategic thing uh, we because we think we've already built a business that is uh, very valuable and very well recognized as a neuroscience specialist um and so all the things that we do should be about uh, further enhancing the value of that asset um in that position in that uh, high growth market um so um another question from sam which I can take. Uh, so what confidence do you have that you will not need to raise additional equity to fund operations in 23 and 24? So again, I'll, I'll answer that uh, as honestly as I can, as openly as I can. Um, so basically, as, as Grant pointed out, we've got a very strong cash position. We, we, we're debt free. Um, so we're, you know, we don't need to raise capital uh, to do the things we want to do. Um, what I would say, though, is, you know, if the opportunities are there and uh, they're, they're compelling um, to accelerate the opportunities, then I think that's always an option. That's obviously one of the reasons for being a public company. Um, but as I said, just the, the, uh, the, the straight answer there, the, the simple answer is, uh, and again, we're very, we, we, uh, we've put ourselves in this position because of the, uh, uh, the traction of the business uh, throughout the whole of COVID and everything else. That uh, that we've all experienced, um, you know, during that period, uh, the company has continued to um, build and invest and and add people and build in technology, uh, all the things you'd expect us and want us to do, uh, if we have the conviction that there is a market opportunity there that uh, we can address. And so, obviously, uh, we do think so, and we do have the capital to uh, to support that. Um, so, you know, that's. Um, that's my answer to to that question. Um, let's have a look. Um, uh, the business is expecting decline in twenty three revenue. How bad do you think two twenty three will be? Um, well, I think that's easy. It's in our guidance. Otherwise, we wouldn't give the guidance. Um, I don't think I need to say anything more than that. Um, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's helpful just to clarify that because yeah. in terms of what the guidance in the market, yeah, just in case people that haven't seen it, so the the guidance in the market um, is that revenues of of seven million uh, and EBITDA loss of a million. So that's that we we announced that previously. That's in the market, so is is publicly available information. Okay, um, Steve K asks, how much of your future revenue can you see and how and what drives potential cancellation in trials? Um, so I'll, I'll answer the second bit, maybe Grant, you can, that's the first bit. So 
what drives potential cancellation in trials? Uh, again, just just to take a step back, we we all know that, um, so developing drugs is difficult, um, can take over a decade, um, and and also the the success rate of a drug going from beginning to end is a single digit. So the industry that we all know is a very successful industry, very profitable industry. Um, we all need it to succeed because we all want to live longer and healthier lives. Um, you know, developing drugs is very difficult. Um, and and the sort of things that means that uh, drugs don't make it all the way to the end, the first and foremost most important thing is patient safety. And you can imagine if it's just you know, ourselves or our family on a clinical trial, first and foremost, we want to know that being on the trial doesn't do them any harm. So, so a reason, a key reason why a drug trial would be terminated early would be for a safety reason. Uh, the, the second one would be for it not meeting its uh, endpoint, um, which would be probably around, does the drug do a good thing? I, is it slowing down the disease progression? Is it curing the disease? Um, so if it doesn't meet its, uh, its, its milestone to, to support submission into the FDA, that would be another reason. So again, the whole clinical trial uh, thing is about managing risk to reward. And, and, and if we take the, the situation in, in Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, drugs have been, no, the, the Biogen drug has been approved and put onto the market. There is a known high uh, percentage of potential side effects with the ARIA side effect, but yet it's still been approved. And, and that's because of the very significant unmet medical need. So, so depending on the therapeutic area, obviously the FDA makes the call on the risk reward profile of the drug. Um, but those are the reasons. First and foremost, safety. Secondly, uh, efficacy of the drug. Uh, and of course, at the end, uh, if they do submit the drug to the FDA, um, the FDA needs to be convinced that it's, it's uh, the risk reward benefit to the population of having that drug on the market uh, warrants its approval. Um, so, so maybe Grant, then in terms of uh, how much of your future revenue can you see? Yeah, so um, I think the best way to answer that question is really refer back to the order book slides that I that I talked through. So we had an order book at the end of September, at the end of the, our financial year 2022 of 16 million. And what that means is that we have signed contracts with clients to deliver services to their clinical trials that we have not yet done and therefore we have not yet recognised the associated revenue of a total contract value of 16 million across numbers of clients and numbers of projects. So what that means is that we have visibility as at the end of September of 16 million of future revenues, which is spread over several years. We then um, we then uh, build up our expectations on the fact that um, we will obviously recognise revenue of that each month. <clears throat> Those projects will develop, and so we have the opportunity to sign new change orders and effectively uh, upsell additional analysis. So that has the potential to push that revenue up further. There's also the risk associated that some of those trials may and uh, may fail early. So the revenue that we the visibility that we have essentially is tied to the contracts that we've signed, and then the expectations we set in terms of things like guidance are driven by our own risk assessment on that, plus the fact that we know that we're bidding on other trials currently and we hope to win some of those, uh, and they will augment that. that that revenue visibility going forward. Thank you, Grant. Um, uh, so, so again, Shagar has asked a question. Um, could you justify the high director's salary pay? So I'm not sure if that's aimed at you, Grant, or me, but uh, I'll, I'll take it as, as me. So, so I, I, I guess again, the short answer is uh, is, is yes. Um, and again, on the basis of um, what we've achieved with this business over the past four or five years. I think something for us to be very proud of. Um, and uh, it's been reflected in uh, making sure that we get the best talent in the company, not just at the director levels, but across the company. Um, I would say as well that we're, we're um, as we currently look to strengthen the, the company, um, and in particular, as we look to uh, be able to address new markets such as North America, 
um, you know, the fact of the matter is that if we if we want to compete for talent, um, you know, we're going to have to pay the, um, the the you know the the expectations and requirements of the best talent that we can we can bring into the business. Um, so you know, I, I would say that uh, we've we've gotten very good value of uh, of the organisation that we have at the business. It's gotten us to where we are now, and um, I'm very confident that uh, uh, that. We, we can continue to attract the best possible people to uh, be able to achieve the ambitions that we, we set out. Um, James C asked a question, um, does your sales process have to change as you target a deeper pool of smaller trials rather than the concentrated large trials? Um, so James, just to, to be clear here, because it um, maybe is how we articulate it. So, so our sales process isn't changing um, and that we've we've always, look to bid on the whole range of types of therapeutic trials what we maybe we're, we're overdoing it a little bit we're, we're trying to articulate that you know we obviously had we, we were successful in demonstrating that we weren't just a small clinical trials company we could also win and deliver large trials and that's important from a credibility perspective because there are lots of trials to be won um we've obviously you know that that trial was was terminated early um and and you know there are other trials that get terminated as well and um, all that we're highlighting is that uh, to operate in this clinical trial space you need to be able to do both you need to be able to win lots of new trials to provide you long-term shots on goal but also when you are chosen uh, for a phase three trial you need to be phase three trial ready you you can't you can't say great We'll be ready in two years time you know the pharmaceutical companies need to know that you're there and you've got the resources to do it so so our sales process um what it what it does need to do is uh is to scale and so we need to be in every meeting that we can we can be we need to be at the table whenever we can be we, we estimate at the moment that we're probably at half of the the opportunities that exist in the market some of that is because we've not had the uh, the products other times we just don't, don't have the commercial reach or, and access. Um, so, so obviously we're working hard to be seen as a credible vendor so that we do get the uh, the request for proposals from clients. And then when we do get them, uh, we win them. Um, and at the moment our, our win rate is around about 30%, 35%, which is very credible. Um, Grant talked to our um, bookings to billings ratio about 1.5. Uh, which again is very credible in the industry i mean in, in the last 18 months it's been over two so in terms of industry metrics um you know we're we're doing well uh, but there's there's a lot more to go after and so it's really more about how we ensure that we build our pipeline uh faster and convert it faster as as we build our, our product capabilities um so no change in our process just uh uh building out our, our reach and our visibility to clients so that we get the opportunity to bid and show them how good we are, basically. Um, so uh, the board are handsomely remunerated, um, yet have bought very few shares and hold a tiny fraction of the company. This is a statement from Francis. Uh, should shareholders um, be concerned about this divergence of interest? So again, a bit of a, a difficult one to answer uh, succinctly other than to say, clearly, I don't believe that the uh, board has a divergence of interest from other shareholders. Um, we have, um, in terms of shares specifically, I, I can only talk to myself. I mean, I've obviously uh, over time uh, acquired shares, acquired them at uh, 80p plus, um, plus obviously myself and Grant and other parts of the, the management team. Uh, have um, long-term incentive programs uh, which are geared around um, making sure that our um, interests are aligned with with the shareholders. So, so I think, um, and I, I would question. I mean, I I don't think we're overpaying our board of directors based on um, uh, comparators that I've seen. Um, and so, I, you know, um, I think again, that's that's uh, as honest answer I think as I can give uh, to the question. Um, so Michael D, uh, great update. Thank you, Michael. Appreciate that. Uh, how is the search going for the new board members? Uh, maybe Grant, I'll give you an opportunity to talk to that one. 
Yeah, <clears throat> so uh, obviously as you've seen in, in RNS uh, this morning, um, following uh, nine uh, great years as, uh, on the board of uh, Xcode, our chair, uh, well in good governance practice, was we'll stepped down during 2023 and uh, our existing, well, one existing nine X director will, will step up. And we are, uh, as a result, looking to appoint a new non-executive director. Uh, that process has really just started. Uh, the board only made uh, the, re the resolution recently, which is why it was in announced um, today. So we're just starting that recruitment process now, uh, and we will hope to be able to update the market with some good news in that respect early in 2023. Okay, we've got uh, two two final questions, uh, both from Sam. Um, uh, so, first one, Grant. I'll give you, uh, following the likely loss in FY23, is it plausible that Ixigo could return to profitability in FY24? I'm obviously, not being able to give forward-looking projections, but just uh, how would you answer that question? So, so I think the uh, the answer is is yes. It's definitely plausible, um, and I and I think the. the, the the, the, the sort of uh, extra colour that I'd add to that is that, you know, as a company, we could have been profitable. We could have put clients out of profitability this year. The reason we didn't do that, and we thought long and hard about that, was because actually the big prize for Xco uh, as a company, and for we believe for our shareholders as, as hopefully long-term investors in the company, is the fact that we are serving I think serving Grant's frozen on us. Uh, can you not hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, yeah. I can hear you now. Yeah, uh, the, we're serving a market um, that is growing and is growing rapidly. That um, uh, is going to need an increased amount of objective analysis of brand biomarkers to distinguish between incremental improvements in addressing these hard to address neurological diseases. And we are really very well positioned to provide that service. But in order to do so successfully, we need, as Julio said, we need to be credible, not only in terms of early phase trials, but being able to run one, two, three, four, phase threes. And so making sure that we invest to put ourselves in a position to do that over the medium to long term may mean whilst we weather some, some challenges in terms of uh, trial failures in the short term, that it's actually the right decision to return to losses for a period of time to, to make sure we're well positioned for the longer term. And that's the decision that we've we've taken. That's what we're we're, we're doing. We're doing it carefully. We're not we're not throwing caution to the wind. We are but we do have a, a careful cost management process. So um, what I'd say is that um, we anticipate and plan to continue to, to rebuild our order book following the loss of these recent clinical trials. And that in doing so, um, that will increase, we hope, our revenues. And because we have operational leverage, because we have a, a well-invested company, we are we have invested in infrastructure, we don't have an, an, an infrastructure deficit, we would expect that the profitability would follow that. So hopefully that, that provides a, a clear answer on that. That's um, great. I think we've lost Julia, so I just wonder whether yeah. I pick up on this. Yeah, there's that, just one final question there. If you'd be so kind, Grant, that'd be great. Yeah, so um, again, question from Sam. You're, you're now ruling out moving into oncology, explain this by the expanded opportunities in neurology, but is there anything you've learned about oncology uh, to rule out moving into oncology? So I think the, the answer I give to that is that um, there are many companies okay. operating in oncology, and we would, if we went into oncology without essentially acquiring something already there, then we would have to ask ourselves the question why we thought we were a better place to be successful in that space than, than those companies that are already there. That's very different in neurology. We've been working in neurology for well over uh, a decade. We've built up a very strong reputation. We have a workforce, uh, an employee base that are, that are very strong in neurological expertise. And so being in neurology makes a lot of sense. In terms of acquisition, you know, never say never. If there was the right opportunity, but it would have to be one that really progressed our overall strategy for, for clinical trials. And right now, it would seem more likely, particularly with our valuation where it is, that we would find a technology type acquisition that would be in neurology than rather than oncology. So 
Uh, it's not it's not that we don't believe that there's value in oncology. It's just that we believe where we are, we're far better placed and far more likely to be successful by focusing on the neurology space than, than that diversification. That's great. Um, thank you very much indeed, Grant and uh, Julio. Uh, we've taken the two final questions for Sam. So thank you once again to uh, everybody this afternoon for your engagement and apologies for the loss of uh, connection momentarily during today's meeting. Um, Julia, I know investor feedback is important and thank you very much indeed for taking all the questions today, but I'll shortly redirect those on the call to give you their feedback. And I wonder if I may just ask you for a few closing comments to wrap up with, after which I'll redirect investors for their feedback. Yes, thank you very much. So again, I'll just begin by by thanking everybody to uh, for taking an hour of their uh, their day to uh, listen to the update today, and uh, generally hope that uh, people found it informative and uh, transparent, and and uh, learn a little bit more about us, and uh, and hope you, you go away from today uh, with um, uh, some of the enthusiasm and uh, confidence uh, that this is a, a, an attractive uh, space, um, and that there's lots of opportunities and. Uh, that we as a management team are very focused on on uh, bringing that uh, uh, to uh, to the company and to the benefit of our, our stakeholders, including our shareholders. That's great. Julio Grant, thank you once again for updating investors this afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please could I ask you not to close this session as we're now automatically redirect you for the opportunity for you to provide your feedback in order that the management team can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure it will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Ixico PLC, we'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. We wish you all a very pleasant afternoon.